Hello, everybody. You're listening to the Girl Wire podcast. I'm your host, Fritz Nelson, and I'm joined by Kendall Fisher, producer and host of the Girl Wire show. Hey, Kendall. Hello. Hi. How are ya? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for our listeners to get into this podcast. It's a very interesting one. Well, they should be interested because this is Rob King, who's the chief financial officer of the American Cancer Society. Now, I'm sure most of our listeners know about the American Cancer Society, but in case you don't, it's an organization that was founded in 1913 to raise awareness about cancer. This actually piqued my interest in researching them. It was actually originally founded genuinely to raise awareness because the phrase cancer and this idea of cancer was so taboo, no one was like talking about it. So it was a group of journalists, scientists and researchers, but they kind of recruited journalists to write about cancer and put out like newspapers essentially about cancer because no one was talking about it. Very interesting. All the way back in 1913. Yeah. And now it's focused on raising money to support programs around cancer treatment, patient support, research, prevention, detection, and treatment. So we talked to Rob about each of those programs and about about a new investment fund the American Cancer Society has started to spur even more cancer research. So stay tuned. This should be fun. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you will learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Fritz Nelson, the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your journey of growth. Before we get into this episode with Rob King from the American Cancer Society, we want to thank our sponsors over at Blue Microphones. Everyone has a story to tell, and if you're a storyteller, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. If you're thinking about creating your own podcast, recording some voiceovers, gaming, reading audiobooks, or whatever you want, then you need to check out Blue's new Yeti Caster. It's a complete mic and boom arm system ready to connect directly to your laptop, bringing the ultimate broadcast studio setup to your home or office. That's what we're using here at the GrowWire studio, and we really enjoy recording with them. They look beautiful. They look professional. To get your hands on one of these setups, visit bluedesigns.com and use the code podcast at checkout for a special price. We also want to make sure you head over to our website, growwire.com, for more stories about nonprofit organizations just like this one. We cover topics like how organizations can prepare for massive growth and big events like Giving Tuesday, to building a strong relationship with your board, to the ways in which other nonprofits like Kiva and Compassion and World Farming have fueled their mission for social good. Check it all out right now on GrowWire.com. All right, we're here at Sweet World. 19 with the CFO of the American Cancer Society, Rob King. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you joined uh, the American Cancer Society 12 years ago. Right. But I just want to go back to the beginning, you know, 1913. That's when this began, yeah. right? Um, what, how did the the American Cancer Society get its start? What was What was the beginnings? Sure. So it was a, a group of, of medical professionals who recognized that we need to bring awareness to cancer. No one was talking about it. It was very taboo. Um, and we didn't know much about it. And they recognized that by making people aware, creating knowledge was the only way that we were going to be able to certainly cure it, but even be able to uh, identify it and detect it and, and prevent it. And so that's, that's really how um, the, what is now the ACS got started. Um, and from there, there was a, a large groundswell of volunteers um, that turned into the, the Women's Field Army. Uh, and back then, they, uh, they were charged with uh, creating uh, or, or preparing bandages for cancer patients because that was, that was really the, 
the outlook for a cancer patient. So we've certainly come a long way. But it, that that was the basis for our grassroots volunteer network that exists today. Why the taboo? I mean, it's like you couldn't even say the word. I, you know, I, 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 it's a great question, um, and, and it still exists today. Um, maybe not so much in the U.S., but certainly in other parts of the world, um, cancer is, is not something you talk about. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done. How has the mission of the American Cancer Society changed from back then to now? Well, the, 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 the wonderful thing and the, and the horrible thing all in the same breath is we know so much more about cancer now. Um, and, and, but we, we still have a lot of answers that we need, right? Um, and so that's, that's really how, at, 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 East, at uh, the society, we think about our work. Um, research really is all about pursuing questions to the answers we'll st we still need. So we're, we're investing in, in tomorrow's solutions, if you will, uh, with our research grants. Um, but then we have a whole uh, body of work around prevention, early detection, uh, public, public policy and advocacy, patient programs aimed at, at um, driving, I'll say, interventions because we know these things work. And so there's, there's so much that can be done to prevent, uh, prevent cancer. It's about knowledge and, and, and getting people access to it. I, I wanted to, I, I realize you've only been there for 12 years and you may not know all of the ins and outs since sure. 1913, so I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but you know, what, what of, of the challenges that you know of that the organization has faced over the years in terms of, of growing, of, of um, getting donations, of getting a public support, you know, can you walk us through a little bit of, of the history of some of the, the obstacles? So we, we talked about 1913. 1946 was when uh, ACS launched its research program, which um, has granted over $4.8 billion um, since then. And that was really the innovation of a volunteer. And then shortly after, in the 50s, um, there was this study called Hammond and Horn. Um, and it was the study that helped link uh, smoking and tobacco to lung cancer, uh, groundbreaking, that led to the Surgeon General and, and the work around uh, tobacco, tobacco what, control. When was that? That was in the 1950s. In the 50s. Yeah. We, we've had several other cancer prevention studies that, that um, evolved from that initial Hammond and Horn uh, study. Not evolved, but it was they were sort of the next generation of those types of, of, of huge cohorts. The volunteers continue to grow and grow and grow. Back then, we were we were the only I'll say we were the only game in town. Um, we were the American Cancer Society, and so you know, fun, it was a different proposition. Um, and also, just cancer, we were able to to generate um, interest. And you know, fast forward into the 1980s, 1985 is when Relay for Life uh, kicked off, um, and that is our uh, one of our signature peer to peer fundraising uh, platforms um, in, in thousands of communities. And it's still sort of a signature of, of who, C, who ACS, ACS is um, at the community level. But there's so many other players in not only the nonprofit space, but the cancer space, especially the, the advancement of new treatments and organizations uh, coming of age that are really focused on um, you know, treatment or of, of like a site-specific cancer, for example. It's a it's a whole new uh, ball game, if you will. And so, when we, you say site-specific, you mean ge geographic? No, cancer site. An organization that's focused just on breast cancer. I see. Or, I see. Yeah, yeah. The challenge is, uh, it, it changed, right? And we were even then we were a large organization, and um, and so having to having to be nimble and change. Um, was not something we really had to do until really the 80s, 90s, and certainly now. Um, and, and with, with digital uh, platforms and, and this, even the idea of community, we were a geography, geographical-based organization around, around physical communities. Well, that's not really how a lot of people define communities now. Um, and so it's, you know, we're, we're having to be really nimble, um, and that's been challenging for us. You mentioned, I, I just want to touch on geography for oh. a minute, um, because you mentioned um, how you started out as more of a local, mm -hmm. and that has changed. I mean, you're the American Cancer Society, but you guys are doing things globally. Right. When did that play, so, play in? Yeah, we've, uh, I don't remember exactly when we uh, first started our global program, um, but we've certainly had a program for, I'll say, at least 20 years. And... 
um, it continues to evolve. Um, and we, we approach it from two, I'll say two angles. Um, one is, is we're able to really help other cancer organizations globally, um, but then we also do mission work. Right now, we're, we're heavily focused in Sub-Saharan Africa um, because that is a place where we know we can have a, a, a real impact. Um, and and it's, it's basic, basic things to us like access to, um, uh, you know, mammography and chemotherapy and even pain medications. Um, and so we're, that, that work is still evolving. We're figuring out how we best can play a role globally and help fill gaps. Cancer control, and again, I'm, I'm not a doctor here, um, but cancer control in the U.S. looks very different than cancer control in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, which is very different than a country in India. Um, and so we have to be very mindful of that and, and you know, figuring out what our role is. And so as, you, as you've expanded globally in, in, in working with these organizations and working on these causes, you know, how has that changed the shape of the organization? Um, we are seen as the the authority um, on cancer. Um, we're it's it's objective, it's scientific based, it's medical, um, and and as we as we've worked with organizations, that becomes it becomes more obvious. But then uh, we have a really big responsibility there to to make sure we uh, preserve that. So coming back to um, a lot of the work that you do. Um, well, even all around the world, can you characterize, um, I don't know if you can characterize it by percentages, but what goes into, how much goes into cancer research versus um, uh, awareness programs versus some of the services you provide for sure. cancer patients? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to very broad categories. Sure. And you can go to cancer.org and, and see our financials and our annual report. Um, research. Um, is I'm going to say about 15 to 20 percent of our overall funding, um, and in patient support is a larger percentage, um, and in those two areas make up a vast majority in terms of just dollars spent. Um, we also have uh, public policy and advocacy uh, work um, that's you know 40, 50 million dollars plus, um, and I, you know. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm always hesitant to talk about it in terms of dollars because um, if you're talking about convening other large organizations around um, HPV vaccination versus on the ground trying to drive transportation for local patients, well, the, the cost profile looks very different um, and it doesn't diminish or, you know, it's not about a value statement of, of the work that we're doing. Um, they just, they look very different. And so our, our financials reflect that. So you're obviously a very big organization. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you've got your hands in, you know, pretty much every pie you can get them in, mm -hmm. but you've got to have a sense of priorities yep. as well. You mentioned that this is on your site. So I want to, I do want to talk about transparency for sure. a moment. So how do you, how do you guys deal with the trans? I mean, obviously you show all your numbers, yeah. right? But what else do you try to do? Do you try to explain yeah. why? First of all, we have a 501c4 that's based in DC, and, and that organization raises money as well. It's on a C, its own. Right, and so okay. it's a C4, and so those uh, those donations are not tax deductible. And so, um, you know, folks giving to that organization are, are aware of that. They know that that's um, yeah, what they're giving to. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of any kind of, of impact reporting we're doing, uh, public policy and advocacy work is, a, is a, always a meaningful part of that. Um, and a big focus, um, uh, cancer research funding at the federal level, um, down to uh, tobacco tax um, campaigns at the local level. Um, that's, that's what we're about. And it's always through the, the lens of a cancer patient. Um, and, and so it's, uh, the work that we do is bipartisan. Um, and, and it's always, like I said, it's always through the, the lens of a cancer patient. We interrupt this podcast episode for a word from one of our favorite sponsors over at Hint. If you don't know about Hint yet, their brand is all about making the everyday more enjoyable and thirst quenching. It started when Kara Golden, Hint's founder, needed a way to drink more water, but wanted flavor without the sugar and sweeteners that come in most drinks. I won't name them here, but she created Hint Water. It has just a hint of flavor from real fruit essences without any of those added sugars or sweeteners. Everyone at the Grow Wire off office is a big fan of Hint Waters. I like the hot buttered popcorn flavor. Not a flavor, Fritz. Still not a flavor. 
We, we can talk to Kara Golden about this. But what about what about night sky and clover? How do you get fruit essence from night sky and clover? I don't know. How, how do those things become colors? <laughs> I have no idea. Why don't they actually check out pineapple, for example, which is a great flavor, or apple, or cherry, even? All right. Well, <laughs> if you insist, go to hint.co slash welcome to get 30% off your first purchase. You talked about the changing landscape and competition. You've got other organizations that are targeted, you know, targeted on an area or a particular, I suppose, type of cancer as well. So how have you faced those competitive challenges? It's weird to think of, you know, we're all trying to solve the right, same right. problem, right? You know, yeah. so how do you, it, it's got to be a little bit of a, what are they, co-opetition yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, it is, a, it is sort of an interesting concept in our, in our industry. You know, it's evolving. Um, I don't know that we've we've um, all been very collaborative in the past, and I don't. I'm not sure that was deliberate. Um, but yeah, we're we're competing against uh, donor dollars. I mean, we're competing against for-profit organizations uh, for uh, disposable income as well. I mean, it, you can you can define competition in lots of different ways. Sure. Um, so, one thing you'll hear from our uh, CEO Gary Reedy um, is just this idea that we are we're open for business. Uh, we recognize that. I mean, cancer is a, a, a big disease and a big, a big set of diseases, right, and a big problem. Um, and we can't do it alone. Um, and so this idea of collaborating with, uh, if it's other NGOs, um, the, the private sector, um, you're going to continue to see ACS um, doing those things. Anything we can do to help solve the problem. Your first step is open up arms, bring them all in. Let's do this together. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't. I'm not sure that we've had a uh, um, a good report card um, in the past of of doing that. Um, maybe it wasn't deliberate, but again, we were we were sort of the only game in town for a long time. Um, and so learning to learning to, to to do business that way is relatively new for us, I'll say. Um, but we know there's power in collaborating with other organizations, whether it's around a specific uh, research uh, project or if it's convening all the right organizations around, uh, like I said, HPV or colorectal screening, um, we, we have a unique ability to do that um, given who we are. And so we, you know, it's, it's upon us to do those types of things. I mean, you, you guys are so, have been around for so long mm -hmm. and attack such a big issue mm -hmm. and have been doing it so successfully, but there might be other nonprofits in other areas that are thinking about this transparency issue outside of just people knowing where their money goes. Right. What about how 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 much do you tell your donors or potential donors about the impact those dollars are making? So we are we are very transparent and I'll I'll use a very specific uh, example. So back in the 90s um, the organization developed a set of 2015 goals. Th there was an overall cancer mortality goal, and there were also there was also cancer mortality uh, mortality goals around um, specific types of cancer, so the lung cancer and, and, and prostate cancer. And, um, and and when we got to 2015, we were very transparent around this is what we've accomplished um, as an as an organization and as a nation in terms of cancer control, and this is where we missed, um, and this is the work that still has to to happen. Um, and, and so we are, we're actually going through um, another three-year strategic planning process right now where we're, we're resetting those goals. Um, obviously, 2015 has come and gone. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, we're, we, we, we take a very honest look at ourselves, um, and, and that's the only way you can do it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what advice would you give to the, the small startup, say, nonprofit yeah. in that regard? So two things come to mind. Um, and they're, and I guess they're pretty broad concepts. Um, one is data is everything, um, and and the one the one challenge we have um, compared to these other um, amazing organizations um, is that they're not they're not tied down by old systems. Um, and so we are we are one organization. We're one five hundred one c three, but that's not all, that has not always been the case. Uh, we were federated. And like 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 many organizations are, um, and and so we developed uh, CRM systems and financial systems that were designed for twenty plus different organizations. Mm. Um, and so you, as, as you start bringing the business together, um, even just from a resource allocation standpoint, much less from a, a customer uh, relationship management perspective, 
being able to be nimble um, with that side of that type of uh, that set of systems has been really challenging. I think the other the other advice is um, don't stop innovating. Um, don't hold on to a good idea too long because it's it's not going to be a good idea forever. Um, and that's good advice for anybody, right? Yeah. If there's a good <laughs> idea, somebody else is going to copy exactly it, and then right. you're going to come up with the next yeah. good idea. Yeah. And so, you know, we're we're like a lot of uh, large organizations having to deal with with the fast pace of change, especially around technology, um, and and learning to let go of things um, and, and fail fast and and move on. And so, um, that's not specific to us, but that's certainly a lesson I would pass on. Let's talk about donor relationships. Um, we haven't really touched on that other than the transparency side of it, but um, what are some of the unique things you guys are doing to engage with current donors, get new forms of donors? Yeah. Maybe what are your different donor programs? Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, at the heart of us, at the heart of the organization, we, uh, we're a community special events. That's what, that's what made us who we are. Um, and I think that will always be a part of who we are, um, although it's changing. Um, and, and so that is, that is a large part of our uh, donor um, and fundraising profile. Um, and that goes hand in hand with some of the patient support work we do, the, the smoke-free laws that we've helped enact um, in the local level. Um, but as we've, as we brought on new types of programs, um, prevention, early detection, well, that can resonate with the corporate. Um, where you can go in and partner with them and their employee base um, and create a whole value proposition. And so we're learning how to, how to operate in that kind of model, for example. Um, and so this idea of corporate fundraising. Um, I'll talk a little bit about major giving. I mean, we, have, uh, we have our Hope Lodge campaigns. Uh, so Hope Lodge is, is one of our patient programs uh, um, and it is a, to give it up as a hotel near a, a cancer center free of charge for uh, cancer patients. And so it's a brick and mortar. It's a great way to, to, um, to rally um, major givers uh, especially. Um, and things like galas, uh, very traditional. But we're also beginning to do um, some, I'll say some new and innovative things, especially around research. Um, and we've, uh, we've launched a, an impact fund, Bright Edge, um, and it's, it's a, a philanthropic version of venture capital. Um, but it's a, it's a new way to engage with um, uh, major donors, individuals, family foundations, um, even corporate foundations. Um, and the really interesting thing about it is um, with with our what I'll call our core research program, where a lot of our money has been invested in basic basic science, but certainly even in translational. Um, but but it it takes years um, in order for for that work to have uh, an actual patient impact. It's that doesn't diminish the value of it. It's still really important. Um, but with Bright Edge, we're investing in solutions today. Um, so we're going out and just like a venture capital firm would. Um, taking phil but we're taking philanthropic dollars. Um, so it's capitalized with donor dollars. That's exactly right. Yeah, um, and and we're leveraging the, the not only the ACS brand and reputation, but also our network of um, researchers and uh, professors and and others, even in private industry, who have played in our network um, to help us um, identify really good science um, that could impact patients um, in a donor's lifetime. Um, and so really treating them uh, as an investor um, and they can actually track their, uh, track their investment along the way. How big is that fund? So we, we, just, we are just launching it um, and, and we, uh, we were seeded with $25 million um, and we're looking to raise uh, um, $100 million and then we'll, we'll go from there. It, it, over time, it'll be an evergreen um, fund, uh, but we're, we're, gonna, we're talking in terms of $100 million right now. And do you, do you envision that those dollars going to new forms of research or pouring into existing research? Like, how are you thinking about yeah. how you want to deploy those dollars? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, the money we'll deploy, we'll invest, will certainly be aligned to the mission of the, the ACS. So we don't want to compromise anything we're doing um, on for the rest of our mission work. Um, but really, we're, we're open in terms of therapeutics, diagnostics, um, other types of technology, um, and it, it could be new research. Um, it could be it could be in certainly in the long term. Our, our wonderful vision is that it's it's research that ACS funded years ago um, that has translated into something that's commercializable, and then Brightest could actually 
invest um, and get it to patients. I mean, that's the, that's the long-term vision. That'll take a long time. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's where we're going. Which American company started with a guy in a garage, was featured on Shark Tank, and now has over 1 million customers? Hint, they're reducing crime in neighborhoods everywhere. Here's Ring Video Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff with his secret to success. It's true. In just a few years, we've had huge growth. We've hired hundreds of people, expanded our warehouse, and we're shipping millions of units a year, all while making sure our customers are happy. I've had lots of things to worry about, but I never worry about our finance and accounting because we use NetSuite from Oracle. From the beginning, NetSuite let me see what's going on with my business in real time, from revenues to expenses, customers and orders, even HR. I run my business from a dashboard right on my phone. NetSuite has been my business management system from 10 to a team of over 1,000. And NetSuite will be my choice as we continue to innovate and grow. Go to netsuite.com slash ring to see how Jamie scaled his business. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash ring for your free guide and the story of a great American company. netsuite.com slash ring. How does the American Cancer Society view some of the new research, the immunotherapy type research? There was just a... Nobel Prize given to a mm -hmm. couple of researchers. Um, is that an area you guys see as promising? Have you invested in it already? Will you invest in it more? So ab absolutely. If you look at our, our research portfolio over the past 20, 30 years, you can you can connect ACS to lots of discoveries. And, and certainly you're, you'll see us granting dollars um, in the immun immunotherapy space, targeted therapies, any area of, of promising science, um, and, and that's, that's where we're going to go. And, and then one thing we're also doing in terms of, of really innovating our research work, um, I talked about this, that core grants program that we've had. We've also launched a, um, a boost program where we go back into that portfolio um, of, of grantees, and we identify, wow, there's something really interesting here. Let's boost them with additional dollars. Let's uh, bring together other partners who can help them get help help de-risk their ideas and discoveries and get them closer to commercialization. And and so you'll see us you're seeing us play there as well. So let's talk a little bit about some of the patient care programs that you have. What are all those programs? You mentioned one earlier with the yeah. hotels. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll 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 talk about them in three broad areas um, um, because these are these are our, our big focuses. Um, and it really is all about um, how do we get cancer patients and caregivers um, access to um, what they need in order to get treatment um, and, 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 and so forth. Um, so information, that, that, that idea of around awareness is still very prevalent. Uh, we have um, a call center, 1-800-ACS-2345, uh, um, or go to cancer.org. Um, and, and it's, you know, that objective information um, and, and that's also a way to connect to other services and programs that we provide. Um, we uh, have a lodging program. Um, I think I mentioned um, earlier Hope Lodge. Um, and is, we also have a program with lodging partners. Um, so hotels work with us um, so that we can try to provide cancer patients with access to some sort of lodging if they need it. Um, uh, because a lot of folks have to travel um, certainly more than 50 miles to their, their health system in order to get treatment. Um, and then we also have um, a really large transportation program, we call it Road to Recovery. Um, and it's a combination of volunteers. Um, so volunteers literally, uh, we coordinate and, they, and they, they meet the cancer patients and take them to treatment, take them home. But we also have uh, collaborations with some rideshare organizations um, and then uh, local you know, public transit um, to help us get patients to, uh, to care if they need. You know, we always focus on prevention and, and treatment. When there is a stage of cancer that's end of life. Do you guys get involved in the hospice part in your patient care? So um, I'm not sure that we get involved um, in, in hospice per se, uh, but certainly uh, palliative care, quality of life has always been a focus um, of ACS. Um, and, and so you've, you've, you've uh, you, you can see that play out in, in really all of our programs um, and, and the information. Survivorship is certainly an area that we're more interested in now because there are more survivors. Um, and so kind of going back to this idea that we are a comprehensive cancer organization and, and trying to cover that whole spectrum 
um, in ways that are meaningful. Well, let's let's end on a happier note. Um, what do you what future things are you guys working on? What uh, what should we get excited about? How can people help more? Yeah. Um, so a, a, a couple things come to mind. We mentioned Bright Edge, um, and, and um, that's a great example of how how we're evolving um, some of our programs um, and really leveraging the the the, the long history of, of knowledge and, and network. Um, and, and so you're going to see, and, and that's also sort of a, a prelude to other types of, of collaborations that we talked about. Um, and so you're going to certainly see more of that. Um, you're going to see ACS um, involved in these, these public health campaigns like HPV, colorectal, um, who knows where we'll go from there. Um, and just this idea of, of, of being open for business. Um, and you're going to continue to see us um, play that out, hopefully, um, in, the, in the years to come. Great. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much to Rob King from the American Cancer Society for joining us on this episode of the Girl Wire podcast. I also want to thank our editors over at Lampstand, our producer, Kendall Fisher. Thank you, Kendall. Thanks for having me. And all of you, our listeners, for tuning in. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Fritz Nelson. Make sure to keep tuning in for more episodes full of tips, tools, stories, and strategies to help take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time.